Self-remembering. As a young wife and mother in a life in which I felt increasingly trapped, forlorn, and desperate, I would take long daily walks, bumping the stroller down cobblestone streets to Harvard Square on a quest, but for what? What? Then came the life-changing day in which the proverbial book fell off the shelf into my hand, open to a page in which its author, Emanuel Uspensky, a disciple of the Russian mystic and mathematician Gurdjieff, threw down the gauntlet that ignited my inner fire. Most humans, he said, have no free will. Rather than being awake, we sleepwalk through life as mechanical beings, caught in a vicious round of conditioned patterns. We think we make conscious choices when actually we react automatically to inside or outside stimuli. Those who do have free will, he claimed, are very, very rare, since free will is a difficult accomplishment that takes many years. Uspensky said that in order to even begin to develop free will, Gurdjieff advocated a practice called self-remembering. Even at that early age, I recognized instantly that he was right. I was clicking through my life like a robot. Yet to actually face the fact that I was unconsciously being pulled by strings over which I had no control infuriated me. I decided to get a grip on myself, to develop my own free will, to wake up. In order to begin to interrupt unconscious patterns of behavior, I instructed myself to be able to stop in the midst of any activity and say, I'm here. Simply that, I am here. So, while brushing my teeth, or changing my child's diapers, or walking down the street, or writing a paper, I began to practice this method of suddenly stopping whatever I was doing, simply to acknowledge my own presence in the midst of the buzzing confusion of my life with husband, children, graduate school in philosophy, and of course my hyperactive, judging, chattering brain. It was not long before I found myself astonished to discover that self-remembering actually worked, that it did help me to wake up momentarily. But then, like an automaton, I would slip back into oblivion. Intuitively, I knew that only if I learned how to consistently wake up as if out of a dream in the middle of any point in my day, and then eventually to actually stay awake during any and all circumstances, no matter how dire or exciting, would I be able to take full charge of my life. I can look back now and say that an enormous gulf separates the capacity to wake up momentarily and the infinite more difficult goal of being able to hold a larger awareness over time. Luckily, I didn't know that then, or I might have grown discouraged. Though I didn't realize it then, self-remembering was my initiation into the practice of conscious awareness. Awareness is the Holy Grail, always on the horizon, luring me on. Forty years later, I'm still on automatic much of the time, and yet more and more I can stay awake for minutes, even hours, more rarely, most of a whole day. At this point, I wake up and fall back hundreds of times each day as monkey mind once again lures me into its seductive snares. Little by little, I stitch together those moments of awareness so that the current of the flow becomes almost continuous an exquisitely alive sense of being here, right here, right now, in this body, at this time, in these surroundings, all senses attuned at one with the whole. And each time I do, everything changes. I find myself awake and aware, steady and serene in the midst of the daily flux. Conscious suffering. By the time I reached my 40s, it was easy for me to wake up momentarily, but I could not stay awake, since I had not yet learned to move awareness into the body. As a typical Cartesian, I had been conditioned to despise my body and force it to obey my will. So learning how to deliberately move my mind into my body has been a huge deal. Of course, what shoots us out of our bodies in the first place is our experience of pain. 
From the time we are tiny, we are admonished, admonished, don't cry, be brave. We gradually learn to suppress the tears and howls of our natural response to pain so that we may fit into society. In the past few years, in order to undo all this conditioning, in order to move into my own pain and stay there, I now attempt to catch my mind in the instant it tries to take over with reasons for why I feel so bad. Each time, to notice justifications as they arise and let them go. Let the ideas go. Whatever they are, true or false, right or wrong, doesn't matter. What matters is that I climb down under my mind and surrender to the feelings that have been triggered once again by some situation in the outer or inner world that has re-stimulated an old, original childhood, probably, wound. Whatever the original wound is doesn't matter either. Causes upon causes, an infinity of causes. Perhaps there is no root cause, just simply the suffering that intends incarnation. In any case, as incorporated beings, we humans are conditioned to develop minds that separate out from our bodies and try to squash or squeeze or stuff them into some kind of shape that meets with the minds and the culture's version of what the body is supposed to feel and look like. Conscious suffering and presence. This second more advanced stage of the practice of waking up, that of conscious suffering, of deliberately and intentionally centering awareness directly into the place in my body that corresponds to my emotional pain, opens another door to the unexpected. Rather than intensely suffering, such focused awareness of suffering sooner or later disperses it to the point where it disappears inside a further heart opening into what I can only describe as an all-pervasive presence that steals in as a calm, detached, but joyfully alive awareness lying just below all my judgments and resentments and woundedness and in fact, all the mind stuff that I then no longer need to rely on. As a result of this practice, my need for intense drama in relationship has mutated into a near continuous feeling of immense gratitude. Such a privilege to be alive in a body on this beautiful earth at this critical time in history. Gratitude is continually fueled by periodic experiences of consciously allowing in the suffering that attends loss. For the practice of awareness has begun to drop me into this larger aware reality on a more regular and extended basis. The awareness of presence, of the all-pervasive love that unites and breathes through all creation may be what mystics have hinted at for centuries. As I continue to open further, the realization dawns that unlike being in love, the big love does not require another person as its object. Rather, I'm immersed in an ocean of love that has no beginning and no end and includes us all as aspects of its singular being. And love is a fountain. It fuels my every move, showers blessings on one and all presence in relationship. I imagine that this experience of presence is similar to the experience of those in a committed relationship where when they disagree both partners surrender their personal wills. Time after time they dare to release control and jump blindfolded and holding hands into the void. These refined humans realize that their relationship itself is a third entity a real energetic substance, the child or fruit of their dissolved egos, and they recognize that their relationship has needs that sometimes supersedes the desires of either individual. Surrender to relationship opens the heart to what is, rather than what we wish it to be, to the reality of the present moment to the presence that undergirds us all and requires radical trust on both individuals' parts. Both are vulnerable, since either could, if desired, trounce the other, manipulate the situation to get what they want. 
The widow of one such rare couple told me that it was two years before she could let go of her own needs and attend to his. Two years before, she said, the moment came when she just let go, finally, of her lifelong self-centered pattern in relationship. I remember the moment, she said, the single moment which changed my life. I asked her if the moment came in response to him. Yes, she replied. Suddenly, something he said made me realize that he wanted the very best for me, that he would dedicate his life to my happiness. And with his surrender came her own. From then on, she would do anything for him to be happy. From that moment on, love was the center of their union. And when he developed a brain tumor, she dedicated herself to his needs for their final two years. My attitude was, whatever he wanted, he got, she tells me with a smile. When he died, consciously breathing his last in her presence, their 12-year union was complete and they could let each other go. We might call this kind of emotional, spiritual surrender to presence in relationship an evolved form of lovemaking. For those who have begun this journey into the open heart, the words, I love you, become almost irrelevant. Though an insecure partner may still want to hear those magic three words, for the other, love is a given. Of course I love you. Doesn't everything I do show it? And yet, just as the world is on the world stage, nations still compete for dominance. So loving surrender in personal relationships still seems rare. Most of us still pursue our own agendas and trivialize the phrase, I love you, by giving it lip service. We mouth the words while our hearts lie elsewhere. We say, I love you, to convince ourselves or to satisfy the other's need for de or demand for reassurance. I love you turns into shorthand for we're still together, don't worry, I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. And this remark can, ma can mask the desolation of deep denial, wherein fear of loss trumps our secret resentment of the one we pretend to still love. From my observations and from my one experience with a relatively long-term relationship, I suspect that even the most conscious committed relationships are based at least in part on a sometimes little noticed and habitual codependency that deftly and subtly worms its way into the interstices of daily life. For example, I recently had lunch with a friend who's going through a quite uncharacteristic hard time. She tells me that her companion of 30 years has been great, but that he hates it when I become vulnerable. I sense that she viewed this as evidence of his love and could not resist the remark. That's because he's the one that's used to being vulnerable with you as his mother. It scares him when his mother leaves. She looked at me in amazement. Far from taking offense, it was as if I had struck a match in the cave of her mind. And what is long-term codependency but a stabilized form of projection? a remnant of a leftover crystallization from the in-love phase. Knights on White Horses. When I was a child, our common human longing took mythical form that girls in my generation translated literally, the knight on the white horse, the one and only soulmate who would whisk us away from ordinary life to life happily ever after. We set ourselves up for disappointment, and as ever, personal crises, when collectively enacted, describe cultural shifts. In the past 50 years, as more and more marriages break and new ones form, as some people live together without marriage and others remain single, either in solitude or to play the field, the more metaphysical among us have begun to speak of soulmates, a whole tribe of beings that we came in with any number of whom can serve as karmic mates at different points on our individual journeys. Despite the blare of corporate, national, tribal, and media wars, on a more personal level, our way of considering relationships seems to be growing more relaxed and inclusive, less polarized. 
Now at holiday tables, extended families reach beyond bloodlines to include former lovers, husbands, in-laws, and stepchildren. Clint, in, Clint Eastwood's two celebrated war movies, Back to Back, empathized with first American, then Japanese experiences at, in World War II. Many of us are as concerned with Iraqi casualties as we are with American ones, and Benetton's colors not only advertise fashion, but also the beauty in ethnic variation. From our growing acceptance of inclusion, it is only a short step to realize that special and unique as our love for one special and unique other may feel to us at the time, this state of being is actually a first step into an extended transition zone that links the surface phenomenon of being in love to the transcendent heights and imminent depths of cosmic love. Most of us have had experience of the first kind of love, the puppy love of projection. Far fewer experience a long-term relationship that helps each partner efface the membrane that divides her or him from the universe. And those individuals who actually do evolve into the greater love that requires no object, but shines from the inside out equally over all, Jesus, Buddha, Gandhi, though so rare as to seem iconic, are actually way showers for the oneness into which I sense we are all, sooner or later, destined to enter. Divine Love Various philosophers and spiritual teachers speak of love as the most powerful force known, the glue that holds the universe together, the substratum of all imaginings, all daily events, love as constant, serene, joyful generosity, the deep oceanic depths below the surface currents of desire and suffering. I doubt that when we say we love someone, we usually refer to this sacred, numinous reality, because if we did truly have the capacity to enter the divinity of love, why would we remain with one person rather than another? Both Gandhi and Buddha left their wives behind in their quest for the larger love, and if the Magdalene was the wife of Jesus, she wasn't an acknowledged part of his mission to spread love to all humankind. Presumably, once we've opened our hearts to the larger, all-pervasive power of love, we remain open and loving, no matter who our companion. Like saints and avatars, we love all equally. Embodied love. So this, for me, brings up a question. As one who does seem to have integrated at least my former projections, now what? Is a personal relationship possible or necessary, or do I turn my gaze to the stars? And yet, I'm an embodied being. As long as I work in time and space, my intimate relationships with others are limited, or seemingly, seemingly limited, to one at a time. I imagine it would be easier to channel divine love through the sexual, sensual, spiritual connection with a single other whom I have learned over time to trust. I would have left the preliminaries behind, no longer slogging through the projection stage with a series of possible partners. Instead, like the rare couple mentioned above, I would have magnetized one with whom, in a single moment of grace, each would drop our selfishness and dedicate our lives to the other's welfare. Together, we would weather the hard stuff. And it would all be worth it. For on the other side of that hard stuff would come the mystical payoff. Our interpersonal interaction would serve as a conduit through which divine love channels into the world. At this point, I speak theoretically, since I've never had the experience that I point to above, at least in this life. But I do sense its reality just as I sensed the possibility of internal integration before it was gifted to me, also like grace. And I do sense that sexual, sensual, spiritual union with the other might be the surest access into oneness, since sexual lovemaking is its physical expression, the small depth wherein we momentarily die to ourselves and are transported into the larger universe. But of course it doesn't last. Ecstasy fades, and we fall back, wrapped in separate skin and bone scaffolding. Towards the One 
In recent years, I've noticed that my relationships of whatever kind, even the split-second, consciously enacted, deep eye-to-eye -eye with a stranger as we pass by on the street, can startle me to the point of dissolving that seeming separation. And if this is so, then physical lovemaking, though it symbolizes oneness, is not necessary. Ultimately, not even personal. One-to-one -one connections with others are necessary. Since on an interior level, we are all connected and always have been. The meditative solitary awareness of the monk in a cave expands to include all sentient beings. I now view any surrender in relationship, large or small, momentarily or extended, as grist for the divine mill. Each time I let go of my own personal will, I am invited to further efface the membrane that separates me from others and enter the abiding presence. I sense that, though we tend to think that what holds a long-term monogamous relationship together beyond the honeymoon phase, beyond the child-rearing phase, beyond and within any particular phase, is on an outer level some combination of economics, tradition, security, shared interests, and companionship, and on an inner level, the level of the real, of the one which holds the, le the relationship together may be quite different. This universal soul longing for reunion with the all-pervading essence of life. And from this higher point of view, our universal fascination with the magnetic projection of falling in love and being in love may be but symptom and symbol of the mystical oceanic love that shimmers through space and melts all forms into oneness. Conclusion. Most of us think of our love for our long-term mates as special and unique. Instead, it may behoove us to see both our dance with the other and our eventual loss of the other as an extended transition zone. First, we experience mere flashes. Then, if we are fortunate and grace descends, longer and longer periods when we do actually surrender to the actual suchness of our beloved, no matter who he is, nor how much the other disappointed or infuriated us in the days when we had expectations of who he or she should be. No expectations, not even as to whether our beloved will stay or go. For though our bodies and minds suffer the pain of letting go, our spirits ultimately soar. As we practice surrender in love and to love over and over again, we begin to become aware of the larger presence that holds the universe together. The key seems to be to recognize that our emotional state in relationship with a certain someone, though at the time important and special and wonderful and or terrible, on another level is merely the latest trigger for the love that resides inside us always and the discovery of which is the larger purpose for which we are born. It appears that no matter what specific dramas we choose to enact, the direction is always towards the eventual full activation of this greatest of all powers. I end with selections from two poems of the Sufi poet Rumi. I am so small I can barely be seen. How can this great love be inside me? Look at your eyes. They are small, but they see enormous things. Gamble everything for love. Don't wait any longer. Silent, absent, walking an empty road, all praise.